Good afternoon and welcome to uh, Spencer Jones's funeral, a celebration of his life. My name is John Von Goes. I'm a civil celebrant. On behalf of Spencer's family, I thank you all for coming this afternoon to pay your respects and your attendance is greatly appreciated. It's no accident that Spencer's funeral's in a Catholic church this afternoon. It was something that Spencer and his family spoke about. Spencer believed in some sort of God. He didn't live um, your run-of-the-mill Christian life. <laughs> Not by a long shot. <clears throat> but he appreciated his Catholic upbringing. He said it helped form his moral compass. He was forever curious about Catholic symbolism and iconography. And we are in this church as a gesture of respect to Spencer's heritage. And uh, may I now introduce Father Joe. Uh, thank, thank you, John, and welcome to everybody at St Mary's Parish. Uh, so let's take some of those Catholic iconography, some of those Catholic symbols. May the light of Christ lead you through the darkness of death to the light of God's love and resurrection. And may the waters and in the waters of baptism, Spencer died with Christ and rose with him to new life. May he now share with him eternal life. Spencer was my friend, and I knew a bit about him. But I've learned a whole lot more about his extraordinary life in the last week by talking to his wife, Angie, and the love she gave to Spencer over the last eight years, and in particular, the love and care she gave him throughout his illness has been an act of immense devotion and human kindness. I also spoke to his sister, Jan, who loved him like only an adoring big sister could. And I spoke to his biographer, Patrick Emery, whose knowledge of Spencer's life is incredibly vast and detailed, and um, make sure you buy the book when it comes out. Let me tell you what I've learnt before we hear from quite a few others who knew and loved him dearly. Spencer Patrick Jones was born on the 28th of October, 1956 in Te Oamutu, New Zealand. He was Josie and Reese's third child. His sister Jan came along first, his brother Ashley and then Spencer. Jan's here today. Ashley was killed in a farming accident when Spencer was 14 and losing his brother was something Spencer never got over. He spent his formative years on the family sheep and cattle farm in Arahina on the Waikato River in the middle of the North Island. Spencer went to Arahina Primary School. He was a quiet kid, reflective and shy, not the slightest bit interested in sport. He was never going to be a farmer either. That was going to be Ashley's job. Needless to say, music and art were his interests. He had a natural ear for music 
and a natural hand for drawing. Now, the musical ear can be traced back to his grandfather, his mother's father, Ted Watson. He was a pianist and an entertainer, a touring musician. He entertained the troops in World War II, and Ted fought in World War I, and Spencer's father, Reese, fought in World War II. Amongst other dreadful things, Reese spent time in concentration camps. Spencer got his fascination with war history because of his predecessors, and apparently had his father ever decided to escape from a concentration camp, he would have had to go and talk to the British-run escape committee before tunnelling under the fence. His humour could be dark at times. Spencer's father, Reese, fell off his horse and broke his back in 1965. He could no longer work the farm, so the family moved to Ellerslie, a suburb of Auckland. Reese bought a news agency and stationery shop. Spencer was nine. He had access to good pencils and music magazines that he devoured. He went to St Mary's in Ellerslie, then St Paul's in Auckland. Spencer was 14 when his parents bought him his first guitar. It was Ashley's suggestion only months before he died. Spencer inherited Ashley's record collection. His lifelong devotion to music had begun. It was 1970 and he owed a lot to Ashley. In 1971, he saw live music for the first time, Daddy Cool in Carlaw Park. It was a watershed moment. Later on, Ross Wilson produced and mentored the Johnnies and Ross Hannaford was a huge influence on Spencer and later today, Spencer will be buried in the Blackwood Cemetery where Ross is laid to rest. Spencer left school and worked as a draftsman for six months. He had a drafts person script. His handwriting was precise and beautiful, as were his drawings. But he wasn't cut out for an office. After that, he got a job at Fisher and Paykel packing washing machines. He got a straight job to appease his father. It was never going to last, although his sister Jan showed me a letter of reference from Fisher and Paykel. He was, amongst other things, punctual and cooperative. <laughs> by the time, uh, by this time he'd formed a band in New Zealand, Albatross, named after the Monty Python sketch. Apparently Spence could reel off Monty Python sketches verbatim. And a woman by the name of Marlene Hopkins sang in that band. Spencer always enjoyed playing alongside women. In 76, he moved to Sydney, he got a job in Harry Lander's music shop in the city. The Bay City Rollers came in one day. Ian Ryland came in a few times and had a bit more impact on him than the Bay City Rollers. Spencer's biographer, Patrick Emery, thinks that the white Stratocaster here today probably came from that music shop. And he went to gigs a few nights a week he was scoping out the scene. He met Brent Parlane around that time, and Brent had a huge influence on Spencer and taught him a lot, introduced him to the birds, Graham Parsons and the like. Spencer liked his music and art, both hard and soft, and Brent will say a few words a bit later. In 1978, he moved to Flemington and got a job at Billy Hyde's in Flemington Road. He met more musos there and started playing in bands. The emotional retards with some folk from um, Albatross and the Cuban Heels with Steve Connolly. They were a fixture on the circuit doing supports for the oils, cold chisel and the like, and Spencer was honing his craft. Beats working after that in the North to Alaskans who were legendary and very funny. And in 83, he moved back to Sydney and joined the Johnnies. For the next seven years, they worked relentlessly and the other Three infamous Johnnies will have their say in a little bit too. The Beasts of Bourbon were born in June of 1983. They'd play for a bit, then hibernate, play for a bit, then hibernate again for the rest of Spencer's life. Spencer and Tex being the two constants of the band. The Beasts were a force. I don't have all day. It, I'll try to cover it all. 
He played with Ian Ryland and held to play with Morris Frawley in the working class Rindo and goes with Roland Howard in These Immortal Souls with Gareth Lydiard in The Nothing Buts with Paul Kelly for seven years. He had his own bands, The Holy Spirit's The Last Gask, Cow Penalty at the Escape Committee. And for most of his solo work, he would turn to Lockie Lockwood to record his records and find his sound. Lockie understood Spencer. Then there were the cameos, the Gun Club, Kid Congo, Rene Gale, Lydia Lunch, Brian Ritchie, and more apologies to those that um, I haven't mentioned. The list is simply too long. You know who you are. Spencer was a vital character in a hugely important era of Australian music and culture. And touching briefly on his private life, Spencer had a few women who were very important in his life. His lifestyle with the constant touring made partnerships tricky, but he lived a very passionate life. He was a romantic through and through. Spencer married Tanya in Sydney in the mid-80s. He was with Mary Ellen for eight years after that. He had a son with Amy, and Spencer loved Alvin, and he was immensely proud of him. He married Lorena. After that, he was with Angie for eight years. They married only two months ago. Their wedding was a small affair and a very powerful declaration of love and life. They married the night before the Brian Hooper benefit, where Spencer and Brian played their last gig with the Beasts. That too was an extraordinary celebration of love and life. Spencer was only 60 years old, which is too young. But that aside, Spencer lived a life wholeheartedly worthy of celebrating this afternoon. Spencer touched the lives of so many in his time. And um, we're gonna hear from some people now who knew and loved him dearly. Angie? You good? And Father Joe has told me that um, any of these tributes, if you feel moved to clap, don't worry that you're in a church, it's quite okay. It's gonna be a bit of crying, unfortunately. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all of the staff and nurses and doctors at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, Melbourne City Mission, Epping Gardens, Valley Care, taking up care of my husband during his final three years of his life. <laughs> I'd also like to thank all of those of his close friends and relatives who have helped us out during this difficult period. And I'd like to thank the public and the music community for all their love and support. Without you all, this we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been able to do this. Spitz and I shared a, a, a quite private life, so it's quite hard to get up here today and speak about it. So I've, I've written this letter to say to him, which I'm going to read out. Spitz, I feel so lost without you right now. And I'm missing you dearly. We first met in Sydney back in 2010. You were supporting a friend's band, if I so recall, that night. After the show, we stood for hours talking about our previous rinse cycles of love we'd endured over the past years and our lives in general. By the end of the night, you were promising to perfume my feet. On <laughs> Even on that first night, you had me laughing to tears. <laughs> I fell in love with Spence the man, not the band. <laughs> we commuted back and forth to each other until I finally made the move to Melbourne because I knew that you had a young son, Alvin, who at the time was only seven years old and I felt it was important to be close to him whilst he was still young. Our early, uh, <laughs> our early lives were full of parties, um, most of them which you were the life of. <laughs> you spent a lot of your early years confronting those inner demons and shattered parts of your life, but you resurrected yourself 
with grace and honour and began to move towards happiness again. Sorry. I promised to stand by you through thick and thin, the good times and the bad times, because I knew deep down there was a delicate, gentle, damaged soul that needed some tender, loving care. I admired your strength and determination when you decided to tackle the huge life changes and your no bush bullshit attitude approach to doing those tasks was real and raw as it can be. You managed to make me laugh every day for the past eight years. In fact, you had the ability to make so many people laugh with that witty, wacky, no filters, sneaky, sarcastic Scorpio sense of humour, even when you were being prickly. <laughs> Your, okay. your outstanding photographic mind just astounded me. It was truly up there on an extraterrestrial level. I honestly didn't need to think for the past eight years as you had every fact stored inside that amazing mind of yours that you could call upon at any random time. Encyclopedia Jones. <laughs> I could listen to hours for all the stories you had to tell. You had such a creative mind and excelled in everything that was music, art and culture, in particular your ability to draw. You're always open-minded to everyone and everything in life. You love to nurture the young and upcoming musicians because you shared their love of creativity. Most of all, you're an amazing husband and father. You loved your son, Alvin Mark Jones, more than anyone here will ever know. Alvin was such a tremendous emotional force in your life. You helped carve out his love of music, art and sport, which I'm sure he will cherish for life. I've never met such a funny, romantic, kind and loving man in my life. You will always be my soulmate. Sorry. We used to talk about how we wish we'd met each other years ago, but we found each other and it's been full of love from start to end. You've ended your life on an even keel, baby. When you got ill, you said to me you wanted to be buried next to your old pal, Ross Hannaford, out at Blackwood Cemetery. So I've honored this witch with a spot for me to reunite with you later down the line, because it's only a matter of time. For you, my husband, my friend, my love, my soulmate. See you on the other side, babe. Brent Parlane, next, the early years in Sydney. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Brent. I'm a friend of Spencer's from a long time ago. Uh, we first uh, really got together in Sydney in the uh, mid-70s, I think it was. But uh, I actually looked it up. And the first time I ever came across him was uh, March the 15th, 1975. Um, I was at a, at a concert at a place called Western Springs in Auckland, New Zealand, where we came from. And uh, I was sort of in the mosh pit uh, with this girl I was just started going out with. We'd only been out with a couple of times. And uh, we were watching an English band called Wishbone Ash. And... Uh, it was really crowded and there was these two young guys standing in front of us and they were yelling out the names of the band members and uh, really having a good time. And the girl I was with said, I feel unwell, and she went to sit down, which is not a good idea at a crowded rock concert. And I'm sort of bending down to see if she's okay, but just at that stage, the guy with the strat started playing this amazing lead break and I sort of stood up to have a look and then halfway through, the, the guy with the flying V started playing a, 
uh, at the same time in harmony and it was just the most amazing thing I'd ever heard and I'm looking up at them and I'm looking down at her and I realised that this relationship probably wasn't going to go much further. <laughs> and, but then the two young guys who were in front of us turned around and offered her help and assistance and I was filled with grief and uh, the, the, there were better people in the world than me. And uh, so fast forward to 1976, I'd moved to Sydney and I was working with my acoustic guitar in these places they call wine bars. And uh, I had to go and get musical supplies from this uh, shop called Harry Landis Music. And I walked in and there's this vaguely familiar young guy behind the counter there said, can I help you, sir? I go, yeah, I want to buy a top E string for my acoustic guitar and one pick, please. And uh, he pulls out one of those ba shopping bags with the name of the uh, shop on the side and puts it on the counter and looks around to see if nobody's looking. And he puts about five sets of strings, a capo, a slide, and a whole box of picks. <laughs> this guy's gonna be my new go-to guy in the music uh, industry, you know. And sort of, uh, we became friends. I asked him what his name was, and he said, Spencer Jones. I said, geez, what a great name. You should be in a band. And uh, long story short, he ended up moving into the share house we had playing music with us, joined my band, and uh, we played uh, all around Sydney and in Melbourne a little bit, and uh, uh, he was just a fantastic guy to be around, great guitar player, and uh, funny as all hell. Now, a lot of you, well, you all know him, uh, but uh, one of the things about him is that he's just a lovely guy, you know, he's got this guitar slinger image, you know, but the fact is he's the sweetest person you have ever come across, and we wouldn't see each other for years at a time sometimes, but I'd run across him, within half an hour, I'm feeling good again. You never walked away from an encounter with Spencer without feeling better about yourself. And boy, we all need a bit of that. Uh, one last thing, I've always been four years older than Spencer, and uh, we'd run into each other after not seeing each other for a while, and he'd said, oh man, every time I see you, I turn into the little kid again, you know, he's my little brother. And uh, he's not going to get any older now, but I'm going to make it my life's work to get as old as I possibly can. <laughs> and so if the guys who run places like this happen to be right, and I run into him one day in the wild blue yonder, man, am I going to have trouble. Uh, no, I'm going to have fun lording it over him. <laughs> Thanks, Angie, for having me. See you, Spence. I love you. Thank you. Uh, the three remaining Johnnies, Billy, Hoodie and Slim. Hello everyone. In late 1982, the Johnnies <clears throat> came to Melbourne for our first ever tour. On the Sunday night, we were taken to a club and introduced to a young guitar player who was working with Slim Whittle's Country Killed. His name was Spencer Jones. <clears throat> All the Johnnies immediately loved him. So much so that we asked him to come to Sydney and join our band. Spencer showed up in Sydney literally a few days later after our meeting <clears throat> and together, <clears throat> excuse me, together we spent the next 10 years touring around the world playing our own brand of uh, rock and roll music. To say that we shared some fun times and highlights is an understatement. One of those highlights came in October 1983. Spencer and I both loved a band from America called The Gun Club. So you can imagine how excited we were when we both got hired to play guitar and drums on their national tour after two members of the band failed to get on the uh, plane to Australia. We loved that tour and uh, were carried on like excited kids. And during that tour, we formed a lifelong friendship with their guitarist, Kid Congo Powers. A few years later, we even made a record with Kid and Tex Perkins under the name The Butcher Shop. They were great times. I've played music with Spencer on and off for over 30 years and he has, he's taught me a lot. Spencer had an incredible knowledge of all things music and showbiz. Anything related to those things, he was your go-to guy. 
some of the things he used to say to me were, always play for the song, Billy. Always play for the song. Never forget to entertain. Remember the cabaret dollar. <laughs> Bo Diddley's the real king, Billy. <laughs> I'm going to miss you, Jonesy, as I'm sure we all will. Friends, I'll leave you with this quote from the great Irving Berlin. His song has ended, but the melody lingers on. Thank you. Well, we knew this day would come, didn't we? It was coming for a long time. Doesn't make it any easier. As Billy said, we met Spencer when he was playing Country Killed and uh, what an impression he made. Uh, it was a high stage and it had like a passageway down the side of the stage to the toilet. On cue, Spencer would run across the stage, hit the wall, slide down the wall and lay in front of the door of the toilet. So if you're coming out the toilet, you had to step over him to get to the bar. He did this a few times and I really don't know why he did it but had me in a hysterics, absolute hysterics. As Billy said, all of a sudden he, he just turned up, Roger brought him to our rehearsal. There was no audition, uh, there was no band meeting, really. He was just in the band. He had his red Dan Electro guitar, bottles of beer. I didn't care if he could play guitar or not. I was more interested in the beer. <laughs> and basically that, started probably an eight-year bender. <laughs> anyway, uh, we fast became friends, like we were greatest friends. We joined at the hip, absolutely joined at the hip. We shared everything. We shared motel rooms, beds in motel rooms, clothes, absolutely everything. And the, uh, we travelled around the countryside in a Tarago, which he, he dubbed the Rubber Room, and uh, some of the tales that come out of there, I'll share with you now. It might be reverent in this holy place, but uh, I'll take you to the dark side. <laughs> anyway, when that door would shut on that Tarago and the, reels, the wheels would start rolling, we'd be hitting the highway, Spitz would bring out this brown vinyl briefcase, he'd open it up and pull out a small can of curried beans. <laughs> He'd meticulously open it, get a plastic spoon, and eat those beans. Within you know, a matter of time, <laughs> he'd turn around and look at us, and he'd, you know, that smile that he had, that wry, <laughs> sly fox smile. He'd turn around and look at us and just, mm, beam, and we knew, that, you know, uh oh, we're in for it. And then it hit you. <laughs> the screaming would start. Pull over, stop! You know, let us out! <laughs> but Spence would tap, mainly Matt, on the shoulder, keep going. <laughs> the smell, I can only akin to tell you, was like rotten eggs with a cigar stubbed out in it. <laughs> it was horrible. But I'll tell you what. For the horror of that stink, I wish I could smell it now. Because <laughs> if I could, then Jonesy would be with us right now. Anyway, thank you. Uh, yeah, where do you start? Um, wow. I think with the cabaret dollar, it went uh, also one for the money, two for the money, three for the money, four we like money. <laughs> but um, Spencer used to say uh, several jokes I can remember. Um, let me plagiarise him now because he had a touch of plagiarism in him to a certain extent. Um, uh, the religious element of the Johnnies would be in the rhythm section, I think he used to remind me, given the um, first names of Billy and Graham. Might be people too young to remember that evangelist, I think. Um, but one, I was think, trying to think of 
so many stories. Um, I don't really talk. I used to let Punch and Judy do the, the talking. <laughs> but um, uh, the, the first tour of, of New Zealand, um, was, uh, well, there was many to come afterwards. Uh, I remember it was an immigration card you had to fill out in order to um, enter the, the country, and it was uh, occupation was a problem for me on that because it mentioned musician, and I noticed there was heavy fines for false declarations, and I, I had a concern. I said to Spencer, oh, "Look, I can't tick musician. That doesn't seem right." Uh, so we back and forth banter. Uh, went something like this, game show host, close, but um, a colourful racing identity, uh, song and dance man, that's getting there. Anyway, we settled on entertainer and I thought then, and I just sort of remember that the other night, that probably best sums up Spencer, no, no matter what he did, and... Uh, Obviously, a good musician, whatever that means. It depends on the context of the person listening. But um, I'd just like to say, probably an entertainer. And the last thing I'd like to say is thanks for coming, and thanks, Angie, for keeping me informed. But uh, when, when I first went to Sydney to join the Johnnies, Spencer asked, what did my mother say uh, when she said I was going up to Sydney to join a band? And um, my mother's still alive, and she's 90, nearly 91. And I said uh, to Spencer, that's a good question. I said to her, yeah, I'm going up there. And she was a bit concerned, and I said, that's all right, it's the Johnnies. And she said, oh, is that with Spencer and uh, Graham and Billy? And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, that'll be all right then. <laughs> Uh, and Helen Katnack, who played bass with Spencer for 15 years, yeah? Yeah. yeah. <sighs> Thank you. Uh, Spencer, I grew up listening to and studying the Johnnies. The first band I ever played in, the T-Bones idolised their cowpunk ethic. Not to mention the Bee Suburban later. Wow, my world was opening up. <sighs> but never in my wildest dreams would I thought that I'd end up playing with Spencer, my hero. How lucky. <sighs> when I moved to Melbourne, I had my own band, Maula, and that's when I first met Spencer proper. I was so happy when he agreed to play guitar and our cover version of Blondie's Ripper to Shreds. And he proudly showed me his new weapon of choice, the Ottawa pedal. Wow. <sighs> After Mola split ways, Matthew Hayden and Harold Fisher asked me to fill in on bass with Spencer's The Escape Committee one night. That was it. Half a rehearsal at Jackson Street in St Kilda. It was straight to the SB front bar and I became Spencer's longtime bass player and friend after that. The Escape Committee went through a few lineup changes with Andy Moore and Phil Gianfrido, who would see us tour Europe. What an amazing time that was, with Spencer showing us the ropes and regaling all his tour stories. His reputation preceded him everywhere we went. And even when I was in Europe last year, Spencer's name was still on everyone's lips. Later, we had great musicians also play with us, such as James McCann, John Nolan, Neil Wilkinson on guitar, Cal McAlpine on drums. Eventually, Dave Nichols on drums and Michael Hubbard on guitar became the current and final lineup. We were just beginning to kick our stride. When one night we were in Adelaide playing middle spot, at a gig, we ended up playing for two hours and the poor headline act had to be pushed back the next week. <laughs> we were in our element and the audience loved it. It was in Adelaide when Spencer first told me he was sick. 
We only played one more gig in Melbourne after that, but I didn't imagine it would be our last. I've played with Spencer for 15 years, known him for 20, played in big venues and small. I still can hardly believe I won't be able to play those songs with him. I know there's so many stories we can all tell and share. He touched us all and he'll live on through every one of us. I'll never forget the last words he said with a twinkle in his eye. Go cats! <laughs> Rest in peace, Spencer. I've got a tribute here from Kid Congo Powers I'm going to read out. Can't be here. I met Spencer in 1983 when he befriended and actually saved the gun club's first and only tour of Australia. The group had befallen personality differences, which means half the band quit at the airport, <laughs> leaving Geoffrey Lee Pierce and Patricia Morrison in Melbourne with no drummer or guitarist. Spence was there as support with the Johnnies and with fast thinking and great aplomb, the makeshift gun club was formed and performing with Spence and Billy Pommer. I was imported a few days later and immediately, rather than doing pesky things like learning songs, Spencer whisked us away to the Elvis Presley Shrine and Grotto in the Melbourne Cemetery. We were very impressed and thrilled with his clued in gent. He set the right tone right off the bat. He was so fun and open with a devil's glint in his eye. On band drives up and down the coast, Spence made sure we saw sights like Australia's Big Orange, the Big Lobster, and my personal favourite, Go Bananas Motel. The important stuff, really. Geoffrey and Patricia and I just loved Spencer. It really could have been a shitty situation and a terrible bore, but Spencer made it about fun and the music. He seemed to know all the songs as if he had played them for years, a real natural talent. No explanations necessary. He and Geoffrey Lee Pierce hit it off famously. So much laughing, so much drinking and so much other stuff, but mostly so much friendship and love. He was a dedicated rock and roller, true and total. When I meet other musicians, they say, I'm a friend of Spencer's, somewhere in some far-flung land and it's always welcome calling card. Smile comes to my face and my heart. And it um, sometimes raises my weary head. One last thing, a few years ago, Spencer got the great Tony Cohen out of his sick bed to record us for the Spencer P. Jones tribute record to be released. Spencer knew the historic and emotional worth of the session for his song, for every person involved. He saw a bigger picture of a musical family, a whole story, another world we inhabit. We wanted to see it happen. This was a gift to us all. A more helpful, sweet, considerate person is rare. He will never be forgotten by me. A really funny man. A true friend. My condolences to the wonderful Angie, beautiful Alvin, Alvin Spencer's mum, and all our mutual friends, and all those he touched. Thank you, Kid Congo Powers. And can I call upon um, his sister Jan and nephew Reese? For those of you who don't know me, I've had the privilege of being Spencer's sister for almost 62 years. Today we're here to farewell him, but to also celebrate my brother's life. I'd like to acknowledge and thank all of his musical family and associated friends who have shared a big part of his life's aspirations and in spite of the ups and downs of his life's journey, were always able to support and appreciate Spencer's talent and humour. 
for many years, particularly at this stage in my life, when I sometimes struggle to recall what happened last week, it never ceased to amaze me that Spencer could pull up quotes or information on any genre of music or individual involved in the music industry, be it local or international. Another constant in his life was his absolute love for his son, Elvin, and his beautiful wife, Angie, who supported him throughout his ill health right up to his passing. At peace now, beautiful blue eyes. With love, he'll be missed, but never forgotten. Thank you from all the family in New Zealand and Australia. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Reese. I'm Spencer's nephew, or as Spencer used to call me, Sunblock. <laughs> Firstly, on behalf of myself and my family, I would like to thank you all, not just for being here today, but for being Spencer's friends. Uh, Josie, my grandmother, Spencer's mother, wanted me to tell you a couple of stories on her behalf, as she can't be here today. Uh, Spencer's early life started out and uh, his career was always going to be somewhat in the arts. At about age two or three, uh, he started out with a different weapon. It wasn't a guitar. It was one of Nana's lipsticks. <laughs> and his easel was her brand new wallpaper. <laughs> uh, at the age of two or three, the snail that he had drawn, she could see his talent beginning to shine. His love of guitar didn't come along until the age of 13 or 14, at which time she felt buying him a guitar was a much better option than having him continue to strum his tennis racket in front of the mirror day in, day out. Uh, this was the start of it all. As for myself, I would like to remember his kind and caring nature, my love of his dirty, smelly leather jacket. Uh, as a child, the musical education that he gave me in my teenage years and the life lessons that he gave me as an adult. He taught me that if I was to do anything, to be true to myself and do it my own way, one of the most important things that Spencer ever said to me, and will stick with me till the day that I die, was, Reese, always remember you can scratch your ass, but there's no need to rub it raw. <laughs> I always saw the irony in this coming from Spencer, <laughs> but I followed his instruction and did my best to make him proud. My whole life I've idolised this man for his talents and his personality and the fact that in my family we were the two kindred spirits. Spencer, I love you. I'll miss you always. I'll always be here, your sunblock. Thank you. I've got a, uh, a, a tribute here from uh, Tony Poehler, the Beast's drummer. Spencer was my mate and my colleague, a travelling companion extraordinaire, a raconteur and rat bag of the finest stripe, a disarming brother in arms. He welcomed me into the Beast's when we tied one on in Bremen, which was the first of many over quite a few years. Spencer always said he was part of the rhythm section with me and Brian, and he was with a few awesome breaks. He was a musical maestro, a poet laureate, and a very nice man to be in a band with. His life was a very crowded hour, crowded with those who loved and admired him. 
none more so than his beautiful, devoted wife, Angie. Love you. Tony and Kath. Uh, Adelita's got something to read. Thank you, Angie, for inviting me to speak. Spence, I'm going to read out some poetry from the Bible. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8. This is for you. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Thank you for everything, Spence. I love you, mate. Rest in peace. Thank you. Uh, Kim Salmon. The first recording session I ever did with Spencer Jones was back in 1983 for the Beasts of Bourbon's Axman's Jazz album. He showed up, he showed up six hours late. <laughs> for the last recording session we did together 30 years later on our Runaways album, he showed up six hours late. <laughs> I'm not saying he was six hours behind the world but that he operated on his own time frame. Ironically, he always had time for anybody and anything. For example, when I'd met him at the start of that year, 1983, at the Bondi Tram, he was playing with the North to Alaskans, a sort of cabaret band for whom psychedelia was their shtick. He wore a wig, didn't speak on stage, waved a lot, and played that white strat. He was also the one member of the band with the time to say hello to the support band and tell them he liked their single. This was a bunch of losers called The Scientists. <laughs> Over the years I found his record collection to be full of records from loser support bands. Some who went on to do great things, others that faded into obscurity, but always, always with a story he could tell about them that made them fascinating. He could pick up threads from anyone's life and weave a story. He paid attention to the details and his story was detailed. He was Albert Finney in, in the film Big Fish. This isn't going to be another one of your tall stories, is it? The character was asked, to which he replied, well, it certainly isn't going to be a short story. I could only think of Spencer watching this film. In his fellow Beasts of Bourbon, he recognised characters and had a story for each. Brian was the devil may care, swashbuckling Errol Flynn. Tony, an impish charmer who could get away with anything. Simon the likeable from Get Smart, Spencer once said to me. <laughs> Boris, unflappable, laconic and cool and ready with a quip for any occasion. James, the underground legend and elder statesman. To labour the yarn analogy, I guess you could look at Charlie and I and say that to Spencer, we were Keith to his Brian Jones, 
the Mick or Ronnie to his Keith, the other guy with whom he went about the ancient art of weaving on the guitar. Tex, his kindred spirit, his, his kindred spirit and partner in crime. In fact, when I joined the band, there were already a bunch of Jones Perkins songs full of improbable stories and characters with rhymes like in the piano grand, and perhaps that's why the ivories are silent in our band. To this day, I don't know who wrote what, and I don't want to know. In my eyes, both, guilty as charged. I was deeply touched when some of the remaining beasts visited Spencer about a week before he passed. He and Tex sat together and went back into the past, quickly picking up the threads, recounting and embroidering. After my time with the Beast, Spencer and I both seemed to have parallel careers out there working the traps solo. Due to that, we drifted apart a little. These were the middle years. In this time of relentlessly working the front bars and residencies around Melbourne, Australia, Europe, USA, he picked up a middle initial and the mythology of Spencer P. Jones grew. The white cowboy hat wearing, playing for tequila shots, wisecracking mythology attached itself naturally to such an approachable guy. He was everybody's legend. He would be that legend. It was an easy thing for him to do. It was like living out one's own fanciful narrative. He was every bit that colourful character of that narrative. One day, maybe around 2010, he came along to one of my bread earning solo shows at The Standard. He was with his lovely partner, Angie, who I'd not met before. He was keen to let me know that he'd moved north of the river and that I could expect to see him a lot more. I did. In the last eight years, I've remembered how there was so much to be uncovered. Not through him being secretive, but simply that, unlike his myth, he simply wasn't knowable in a short space of time. I found him to be in touch with the grassroots indie scene, not just of Melbourne, but practically everywhere he went. He was a mentor to many young bands. I was reacquainted with his astonishingly wide range of general and specific knowledge. He could have you enthralled about filmmakers, actors, artists, ancient symbols, and of course musicians. And they're all the stories of things that happened to him. Like the time he went missing for 12 hours after being discharged from Royal Melbourne, Lockie finally locating him. Spencer could account for four of those hours, but told us how he'd seen a robot, just like R2-D2, that went around the hospital corridors taking food to patients. The rest of the time mattered not. <laughs> he lived in a different reality to the rest of us. We'd, we'd put it down, we'd all put it down to the booze and drugs over the years, but getting to know him again, I think it was just the way he was. He told me Angie had suggested he reach out to me, and he did. We did some gigs, an album just eventuated out of it, Runaways. We went in unprepared and consequently neither of us had anywhere to hide. But this isn't about me, it's about me watching my friend adapt to situations in his way. Always patient, always ready to work outside his comfort zone. This is the only place you'll ever hear SPJ rapping. Always, ad always adaptable, always able to put the best spin on any situation. That was Spencer right till the end. I won't miss the myth. It's all around and, and will go on and on and grow. Spencer Jones, on the other hand, is far more complex and surprising. I will miss him. I will go on missing him. Thank you. And Paul Kelly. Spencer, remember when we first met? Of course you do. You remember everything. I forget most things, but I remember meeting you. It was the early 80s, and I'd just come off stage playing with my band at Macy's in South Yarra. You came up to me and started talking. A skinny kid with big ears, looking like you'd just stepped off the farm. You had quite a bit to say. You told me what was good about what I'd done, and what was not so good. <laughs> we talked about other music, on which you had 
forthright opinions. I thought, this guy's pretty lippy and pretty interesting. I can still see us there, clear as day, nearly 40 years away. Spencer, we did a lot of miles together. Remember driving across Canada over the Rockies in 2002? Just you and me? Well, just me driving. You didn't drive. <laughs> but you kept the music going and the chat, and you kept me awake. Remember the elk in the main street of Banff? Of course you do. You remember everything. You were a demon at the nine-letter word game in the paper. When we toured, usually a few of us did it on planes, in vans, you always got more words than anyone else. Your grave is always excellent, and you always got the nine-letter word. You made up the phrase, the pretendies, in the van one day to describe those times when you feel like a complete fake on stage, when you wonder, who am I kidding? What the fuck am I doing here? The pretendies are contagious. They can spread through a band in a matter of seconds. It still happens sometimes. And when it does, I think of you. There's a name for this condition, imposter syndrome, but it will always be the pretendies to me. Remember when we met Nelson Mandela? Of course you do. You remember everything. Nelson walked down a long line of performers, including our band, and shook hands with everyone. But the only person he spoke to was you. He stopped right in front of you and said, I like your hat. You were pretty pleased about that. Spencer, I'm wearing the Andy Warhol tie, the Andy Warhol Elvis Presley tie. I bought it at the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh when I went there with you. You loved Andy and you loved Elvis. You got to the museum an hour before me and left two hours after. I'll never forget the look of joy and wonder on your face in that place. You were a great enthusiast as people have spoken about today. When you loved something, you wanted to share it. This was your generosity which made you such a great mentor to many young bands and songwriters. You championed the drones when they first came over from the West. Says Gaz, I felt like a freak. I was making this traumatized music. I wasn't proud of it. I just had to do it. Spencer got it. You saw people you liked, and played with them, either putting them on the bill or in your bands. Many here today can testify to this, and many have already testified. Phil Gianfrido from the Escape Committee days posted last week, Spencer taught me how to write a song and play the guitar without fear. He protected us even when he got us into trouble. You taught me too, Spencer. You were a walking encyclopedia of music. You knew all the stories behind the great records and the great obscure records. Who produced what? Who played on what? Who wrote the songs? You said, all the notes in music are good. It's just that some of the people that play them are assholes. <laughs> you didn't play the guitar. You played the song. Didn't use a lot of notes or effects. You just carved out a sound with your bare hands, sweet and raw, tough and tender. I carry you in my song still, the ones we recorded together. The somewhere over the rainbow riff in midnight rain. The volume pot swells in if I could start today again. The slide guitar in how to make gravy forever with me. Spencer, you knew dark times. You could be moody, unpredictable, prickly. But you were frank and fearless, full of heart and humor. You had a code and you were an honourable man. I've seen in recent times your great love for Angela Louise and hers for you. This has been a privilege to witness. You've left us too soon, too young, Spencer, like many of your good friends. Wherever you go, wherever you're going, I like to think they are there too, waiting for you. Brian Hooper, Ross Hannaford, Morris Frawley, Tony Cohen, Shane Walsh, Ian Rylan, Steve Connolly. That'd be quite a band. <laughs> I'd like to be at that session, you all playing together, smashing and picking your way through any number of those great songs of yours, 
Run with it, maybe. Or the world's got everything in it. Sailor's grave. She walks between the raindrops. And of course, thanks. Thanks, Spencer. Thanks for the water. Thanks for the wine. And lastly, Angela Howard. So, so much love to you, Angie. Unlike Paul, I don't remember exactly when I met Spencer. But whenever it was, it was a long time ago. And whenever I did, he had a twinkle in his eye and a smile on his face, and he was very charming. I didn't really know him all that well, not as well as a lot of you here today. But I did have a connection. Uh, to my astonishment, I found myself playing in a band with Spencer a few years ago, which was both terrifying and fantastic for me. At rehearsal every Monday night, he would come along armed with a few stories about spending the night in a castle in Vienna or uh, hanging out with a super cool band like the Gun, Gun Club. And he always had a little snack that Angie had wrapped up in glad wrap for him, like some iced vovos or something sweet. He had a sweet tooth. He was funny and he didn't waste words. He was, as has already been stated, a walking encyclopedia about music, bands and songs and seemed to retain every fact he'd ever heard about music. I'm really not sure how he did that when he was, I think, partying quite hard for quite a long time. He was a magic fiend on guitar and I always loved his voice. He was very generous of spirit. He was very encouraging to me when I was beginning my journey with my bass guitar. And when he left the band due to illness, his, his words to me were, just keep your eyes on that drummer, Angela. <laughs> Wise words indeed. It seemed to me Spencer's love was made up of two things, music and love. And partying, I guess. <laughs> when I visited Spence the day he died, he was breathing deep and fast. And he had been since he woke. He was on his journey and it was a hard one as if he were marching up a mountain without any break. He was also purring like some big old panther. When I said that to Angie, she told me that was probably why he had such a close connection to his cat, Lola Baloo. <laughs> the room was full of close friends and I really wasn't sure what I was doing there. But over the next few hours, people left and I asked Angie if she'd like me to stay and she said yes. I found myself alone with him for a few moments and I thanked him for his kindnesses to me and I kissed his hands and I told him everything was okay and that this was indeed a good day to die. A belief of the American Indians, or so I'm told. 
Then as I was holding his hand, a song came out of me, which I'm not going to sing for you now, thankfully, <laughs> but I will tell you the lyrics. This song had been nesting in my heart for a long while, and I sang it soft and low to him. I will wait for your peace to come to you. I will wait for your peace to come to you. And I'll sing in the darkness, and I'll wait without fear, and I'll sing in the darkness, and I'll wait without fear. I will wait for your peace to come to you. As I was finishing this song, Angie and her friend Sarah came back into the room. And we realised Spence had calmed right down. His breathing was back to normal. He really was at peace. A few moments later, with Angie holding his hand and gently speaking words of love, he stopped breathing. I'll oh, miss you, Spence. I've been thinking so much about you. Please say hi to Roland for me and to Brian and all those beautiful men that went for you. And thanks, just thanks for your kindness and thanks to Angie. We're going to have a look at some pictures of Spencer throughout his life um, with some recent music that he recorded as yet unreleased. Just to hate to see you cry There's nothing worse that I can't think of And it's a thought I'm on the brink of I just to hate to see you cry How I hate to see you sad When you look at me that way And I know you're hurting bad How I hate to see you sad So reach out for my arms Girl, you know you got a friend And those tears are gonna dry In the end Just to hate to see you cry When you look at me that way And the hurt won't go away Just to hate to see you cry I just to hate to see you cry 
Don't say thank God I say thanks to myself I still got my health, my kid And a friend or two And I'm tired of doing wrong Thankfully the monkey has gone So talk to the hand Try and understand This time it's you that needs help Not me And I knew it all along Now that my monkey has gone But that's a different song Thankfully the monkey has gone The conclusion of this ceremony, shortly, uh, Spencer's body is going to be taken away to Blackwood Cemetery to be buried. This will be a, a private burial, and um, it's Andrew's wish, and um, if you could please appreciate that. But uh, later this afternoon and this evening, Spencer's life will be further celebrated at the Thornbury Theatre from about 5.30, so please turn up. Father Joe. Before we go our separate ways, let us commend Spencer to God who is love. May our farewell express our affection for him. May it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope. One day we shall joyfully greet him when the love of Christ, which conquers all things, destroys even death itself.
saints of God, come to his aid. Hasten to meet him, angels of the Lord. May Christ, who called you, take you to himself. May angels lead you to the bosom of Abraham. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. In peace, let us take our brother to his final resting place. If you could please all stand. Spencer Patrick Jones, rest in peace. <laughs> 